Okay, so I'm going to talk about machine learning and big data in cybersecurity. I really like this title because I managed to put three buzzwords in one title. Um, and the three parts of this lecture, I'm going to start with a really short introduction to machine learning. Those of you who are machine learning experts, please expect to be bored a little bit. Um, I'm going to talk about security applications of machine learning, and then I'm going to talk about cybersecurity and what the industry use cases, specifically what we do at RSA. So just a little bit about myself. Um, as I said, I did my PhD in Tel Aviv in uh, machine learning, specifically neural networks and, and fuzzy logic. Um, I wrote a book about it. It's in Amazon. It costs about $100. If some of you are thinking about what to buy for Rosh Hashanah to your friends. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and since then, I moved to the industry. I worked for NICE for uh, NICE Systems for, th for four years, and now I'm at the CTO group of RSA. And I've been doing a lot of machine learning at the industry, at uh, the academy, and prior to this, at the Israeli Navy. I wrote algorithms for anti-missile systems, defense systems. Um, here are my details. You can email me, you can fax me. I think we have a fax machine somewhere in our building. I'm not sure where it is. Um, usually after talks like it, I get a few questions and a lot of CVs, all welcomed. So since we're at the, the academy here, do you know what the first thing is when you go to write an academic paper? What's the first thing you write? The conclusion, right? You start with writing the conclusion of the paper, you end with writing the introduction of the paper. So I'm going to start with concluding what I'm going to talk about and what, what the state of the art in the business of cybersecurity is. And the, the hot trends, machine learning, big data, cybersecurity, everybody speaks about them. And the world is dramatically changing. There's the mobile, the movement to the cloud, the internet of things. It's very different from what it used to be five years ago. And cybersecurity utilizes or try to utilize machine learning tools over big data. So again, here are the three buzzwords. And it's very challenging. It's also very interesting. And what's most importantly, I think it's inevitable. So that's the conclusion. Those of you who want to catch the next train to Tel Aviv, please do so now. So going back to machine learning. What is machine learning? There are some definitions. So it's a field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. That's from 1959, what started with artificial intelligence and machine learning. And you can do a bit more formal definition of it. So if you have some experience and some task and some measure of performance, so you expect that given a specific task, if you have some experience or some data, the performance would be better than just trying to solve the task without looking at the data. So going even a bit uh, backwards in history, we had the scientific um, revolution in the 16th century. So these are very roughly the stages of how we do science, at least theoretically. We have some observations. We look at the observations. We try to define an analytical model that suits these observations. And then we, go, uh, we define predictions from this model. And then we do some experimental uh, validation. Hopefully it works. If it doesn't work, we change something, usually the test set or our measurements, and if not, then the model. And the most famous example, of course, is the solar system. We had a lot of observation, and we had the model, and it didn't really work, so we changed it to the solar system uh, model. It didn't actually work better. It was much more elegant, but it's a nice example for, for this flow of how to model data. I have no problem with observation, predictions, and, and validation. I have some issues with how to build analytical models. And, and the biggest one is that it's very difficult to build analytical models. So we have a few uh, more detailed problems. One, it's complicated. It's much more easier to give, it's much easier to give examples than to define exactly how the model should be and how, how reality works. So one example here is to detect um, emotions. So there are a lot of emotions, they have a lot of faces, a lot of images, and I want to detect anger, fear, surprise, stuff like that. That's a very challenging task. And I can define some features 
the distance between the eyes and, and the posture and what you do with your mouth, but it's very difficult. What I can do very easily is get a lot of examples, get a lot of pictures of people with emotions or some actor with emotions. So examples are, are relatively easy to get. Analytical models are much more complicated to build. Also, unlike the solar system, our world is very personalized and getting more and more personalized. So look at Amazon and their recommendation engine. So you go there and you, you want to buy a book, say something about neural uh, networks and fuzzy logic stuff, and then, then you get recommendations, sort of five more uh, books that you might want to look into it, that may be one of your friends or other people that purchased this book, also looked at these books, and it's personalized to your behavior and to a lot of stuff that Amazon knows about you. And it's very difficult or it's um, not so helpful, helpful to design a really big model where we want a profile of each user. We want a personalized model. Just so that I won't feel ridiculous later on, there are people here who don't speak Hebrew, right? Right? <laughs> okay. And the environment is highly dynamic. So unlike, again, the solar system, which is roughly stayed the same, uh, it, it behaves as it used to behave millions of years ago, um, the, our environment is highly dynamic. So how many of you ever purchased this shoe? Not, not necessarily the pink one, but <laughs> Crocs. OK, and how many of you wore it on, on this summer, or used it this summer? Okay, so that's a bad example. Uh, <laughs> but it used to be huge, right? Everybody bought it in the stock and it had huge value. And now, at least not so much. And this is one example, and, and this is from, I think, two or three years ago when I carried out this lecture. I gave it a few times, and then I updated it with this. Do you remember this guy? Sai, I think, and the, what was the name of the song? Gangnam Style. Gangnam Style, right. Yes, so again, billions of, of uh, views in YouTube, and now I think he's still making songs, right? He's, he's a songwriter or a performer, but I didn't really see any new songs. I don't think it's because he didn't, wrote them, didn't write them, just because he's not as famous as he used to be. And I thought of what new example I can add for this lecture. I think you're familiar with this one. So everybody's doing it right now and challenging, and, and some of the people that do the Ice Bucket Challenge actually do um, give money to ALS, some small portion of them, I assume. I also assume that in one year I will need a new example, and when I show this image, probably half of the people in the audience will know what I'm talking about. So things are changing rapidly, and it's very difficult to take an analytical model and change it as rapid as reality is. And there's the data explosion. We have more and more data. They're moving from uh, terabytes to petabytes and to something bytes that we're less familiar with. And yeah. <laughs> and, and while it's easy to write models if you have three, four, five features, what happens if you have 300 features? How can you even define a formula with the, when you have so many inputs? It's very difficult. Um, this is an example of RSA risk engine. Um, I'm here on a working day, so uh, one of my obligations is to say RSA a few, a few slides. So we have a risk engine, and we have about 140, 150 features. And we can define a few rules, but it's very difficult to define a rule with so many features. We say that the number, the magic number is around 7 plus minus 2. So you can define a rule with 7 features if you're very talented with 9 features. It's very difficult to work with so many features. So here comes the machine learning paradigm. So instead of building this complex analytical model, why not just put a lot of data and make the system learn from the data instead of trying to tell it what to do, trying to help it learn what to do from the data. So in a nutshell, this is why, we like, why I like machine learning. So there are a lot of applications for machine learning. We're surrounded with it. The purchasing recommendations in Market America and, and a lot more sites and personal advertising in Netflix. So this is the next movie that you'd like to watch, that you should watch. 
and fraud detection, all the credit card and online banking and many more, and natural language understanding and Google translation and other stuff and Siri and Pandora for music and Tabula. I don't even remember what they do, but there are <laughs> many applications and we use, we try to use machine learning everywhere, wherever we have a lot of data and even more, even better if this is a um, machine generated data that is more structured, then machine learning is a good, a good tool to use. So here's an example from our own uh, environment. Um, when I listened to Claudia's lecture before, I thought that maybe this is not a, a good act to follow because everything she said about privacy, that's exactly the stuff that we don't do. Um, <laughs> What, we, what I can say is that I really like the consent part. So when I, when I first interviewed and then signed the contract with RSA, I received, I think, a 15-page contract written in a, um, legal English that you never understand. And somewhere there, there's a section that says that everything you do is monitored. And so email communication naturally, but all the websites that you um, communicate with and all the stuff that are on your computer and basically everything that you do um, and, and the iPhone that they were generous enough to provide me and with the small applications that send them all the data so they know which application I install and where I am based on my uh, GPS. So basically they know everything and we try to tell ourselves that we have nothing to hide, right? So this is the EMC environment, and I'm only talking about the internal IT network. So we have about 1.5 billion events per day and petabytes of storage, about 70,000 users across 87 countries and more than 100,000 machines and more than 2,000 servers that generate data. And basically at the end is the security analyst or the IT analyst, and he works uh, on his um, machine and his boss comes to him and said, what's going on, what's happening? And you have no idea because everything is there, all the data is there, but no information. It's very difficult to access this big data. So on one hand, you monitor everything and you get everything, but on the other hand, you just drown in this huge lake of data and you can't really understand what is going on. Specifically, if someone breaches your system and there are attacks, how would you know? How would you distinguish between all the benign data that's going on and the very directed specific attack? And by the way, for those who, who don't know, RSA was breached three years ago, uh, which is a bit embarrassing for a security company. Um, but it's a very good thing for uh, uh, security researchers because then you get more budget because I understand that there's a real threat. So there are two sides for everything. Um, yes. Yes. And I was wondering if, if you were aware, I mean, maybe this is probably not known, it has happened. Do you think it's very difficult to make sense of the data as a whole? If, for example, through some personal issue with somebody, it might be relatively easy to somehow find something that they have wrong that might be grounds for, for example, hiring somebody. So I was wondering to what extent this has been a problem, or if it's known to have been a problem, or, or being a problem like being uh, Meaning using this, this monitoring information for, for example, uh, making, for firing people without you know, giving them like, uh, like justifying firings that are maybe based on some other type of problems that are not derived from. I'm not sure about firing people. We definitely apply tools to this data. Um, we have data exfiltration tools that analyze all the data that leaves EMC promises and some analytical tools that look for um, sensitive stuff like social security numbers, um, but they're very rough. Uh, so it's very difficult to, to actually personalize the things and really understand what is going on and what users are, are misbehaving, and that's exactly what I'm trying to do. Yeah, but, but that, that's basically saying, okay, I have this data, I want to know, this, the question is, is, is there anybody misbehaving? That is one possibility. Another possibility is saying, I want to go after this person. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to go to the logs and try to find something mm -hmm. that justifies you know, me firing this person or me you know, doing something to this person. 
I don't think it's actually been used for that purpose, mainly because it's a large company, so the guy that wants to fire someone has no access to the data. Um, so the distribution of Yes, yes. Uh, they do use it for security reasons. So once we get an alert per specific person and you try to understand is the false alarm or something actually is going on, then you start to really deep dive on what the person is doing. And you get a lot of understanding of what he's doing. And in most cases, he's, he's OK. Even he, if he was infected, he's still OK. And you get a lot of visibility of a lot of stuff that he's doing. And even in my research, in, in some cases, I got visibility to stuff that I knew that the person who did them would feel at least awkward if he knew that I'm looking at his data. Uh, on my defense, I can say that we try, when we do the, the rough study and we just play with the data, we try to do a lot of it on our own data. So we know the, uh, I know a lot about my peers. Um, and when you deliver someone on, a, on an enterprise base, it's much more strict. One example is emails, which is, is very sensitive. So for some stupid reason, I don't have access to all the emails of the company, although I have a lot of things that I would like to do with them. So there are limits. And it's just theoretic. It's really security oriented or IT oriented. But that's a good idea. <laughs> OK, so what I'm trying to do here is, is go very rapidly on the machine learning flow. And instead of just uh, explaining what we do in each step, try to take a, a real example and see what we're going to do in each step for this specific example. So the example is our own internal network with its petabytes of data. And our goal is to, to uh, protect our company from attackers and hackers. So we, we start with data extraction. There are a lot of data sources over there. There are servers, syslogs. Anytime that I uh, download some emails, so the mail exchange server says that I communicated with them, and I download some data every time I uh, communicate with Google. My proxy server says that I communicate with this and this site, and here are my requests and all the data. So everything is, is carried out through servers, and these servers are very chatty, and they're happily, uh, they happily um, share the information with all of us. We can look at the network traffic, not only listen to the servers, but let's sit on the wires themselves and see the packets and understand what's going on. And uh, everything that is not going on in the network or in the servers is happening in my end device. So we have also agents on the end device, and we know what's happening in the devices. So which um, documents we're working on, uh, what we're reading, what we're writing. There are also external databases that we can enrich from the HR databases, the badging system. So when uh, someone is coming to the office, leaving the office, there's a lot of data there. And from a machine learning perspective, the more the merrier, right? You want to use as much, as much data as you can if it's there. So that's, that's, that's too much information or too much data. So we want to extract features from this data. And in this use case, what we extract is the IPs that I'm communicated with or I'm communicated from, and what specific port, which can tell me things about the applications that I'm using and how much data is transmitted or received, and what are the activity times, and which device type, and which application types. A lot of different features. And once I have these features, I have two types of learning. The easy one is the supervised learning, when I have labeled samples. And in this case, when I have labeled attacks and labeled benign usage, and then what the only thing that I have to do, uh, or only thing that is left now, is to build a classifier. So here, a good example. Here, a bad example. I want to build a classifier that, given a new example, would classify it as accurately as possible as a benign or a malicious attack. And there are many classifiers out there, SVMs, NN, GMNs, based on networks, you name it. But this is the easy task. The harder task is the unsupervised learning in which I have a lot of data, but it's unlabeled. So I have all the uh, data samples, all the interaction, all the communication. Nobody is telling me if this is a benign interaction or a malicious interaction. So what that I can do here is go to what is called as anomaly detection. And I assume that most of the things that you do are fine. That's your regular behavior. So I'm trying to profile your behavior and your regular behavior. And once that I have a good profile, a good solid, statistically solid profile, I'm trying to look for anomalies. 
So if you're doing something that is very anomalous, it's, it might be that it's not you doing it, it's some attacker or some malware within your machine. So that's what we do, try to profile and, and detect anomalous behavior. That's much more difficult and much less accurate than uh, the supervised example in which I know what I'm looking for. for. Here I don't know what, what I'm looking for, I only know what I'm not looking for. I'm not looking for regular behaviors, I'm looking for all the rest. I have no idea how the attack would look like. There are advantages and disadvantages. The disadvantage, of course, is if I'm not, I don't know what I'm looking for, then it's very difficult to find it. The advantage is that I'm, I'm very flexible. I'm not tuned to previous known attacks. I'm not uh, tailored to specific malwares or specific viruses. I don't really care how the attack would look like, again, theoretically. Um, all I care is how you look like, and everything else might be an attack. So once we learned uh, the model, now we have output. And this is again, um, I think in, in some point, this is where we depart from the academic part to the industry part. So all the models provide uh, results, but here we provide the results to the analyst and we need to make sure that the analyst can make good use of them. So it's not enough to tell them that I see something here because I can never guarantee that I have 100% accuracy. So I do want the analyst to analyze the data, investigate it, and try to understand what's going on and decide for himself. So I need not only to give some alerts, but also to make it as explainable and understandable, comprehensible as possible. So we need what we call a white box model, something that provides results, but also provides some explanation about the process and why do I think that this activity might be malicious. And this allows the analyst to investigate and to explain and to get better decisions. And the last point is the feedback. So we want to, to tune to customer uh, feedback. The customer in, in this respect, or the analyst or security expert, they know a lot about security. They have tens of years of security research and security um, work and, and analyze of different uh, use cases. And I want to utilize this knowledge, this tribal knowledge. So I want, to, I want them to, to give me feedback to say that this is, a, this is a lousy system, these are crappy alerts, these are good alerts, and then use this, uh, this feedback and tune it back to the system and, um, or feed it back to the system and tune at all levels of the system. So tune the, the data, maybe I need more data that I don't look at now, maybe I need additional features, maybe my learning is not good enough, and maybe everything is great, I just don't explain myself and I need to do some better, or to provide some better output. So this is the flow, and, and this is the flow for a lot of machine learning applications. There are a lot of issues here, both theoretical and practical. So even if I know that this is what I want to do, build the feature, extract the data, and build a model and all of this, there are a lot of questions here. So how do I choose the right features? I can choose the features that I can get from the data, that probably, uh, in some cases, thousands of features, which features are good, which are not helpful, and, and which deteriorate the performance of my system. And which model do I want to use? And how do I train the model to, uh, to get good results? And how to evaluate the results? This is a, a very challenging in the unsupervised example because I don't have labels. How do I know what are the, what's the success, success rate of my system? This is the theoretical stuff and there are also a lot of practical stuff which are really annoying because even if you know exactly what you, what you want to do and you have these great models, and you try to implement it and it performs poorly and it happened to be a lot of times. Because of this little tricky stuff like data normalization of the multiple sources. So I get inputs from different servers but they have different clocks. So I have different event times but I need to synchronize all of them. Which is a very easy task when you have two or three data sources. But if you have 2,000 data sources and people just come and configure new servers and nobody's telling you because nobody knows who you are and even if they know, they don't really care. So how do you automatically synchronize all this data? And there are a lot of big data issues. So we have petabytes of data and we have these great analytical models that I want to implement, but it takes them days to run over this data. So you need not only to have a, a good idea and good model, but something that is practical and runs fast enough. 
And then we move, we move from databases to distributed systems and Hadoop and MapReduce and it makes it very challenging to write your nice, I don't know, Python algorithm or even MATLAB algorithm in, in Java native MapReduce. Um, hopefully in, in many cases you have developers that do it for you because they have no idea how to run Java but uh, even then, then you have another issue of how to explain to the developer what exactly you meant when you wrote that you want to do this and this. For you, in many cases, it's very um, easy to understand. For them, they have no idea what, what is going on. And how to get labeled data? You need, at the end, someone that will tell you something about what is going on and will give you some feedback, even at some uh, sporadic evaluation level. And who is this person? How do you talk to him? And does he want to help you? Does he have the capacity to help you? Uh, especially in large enterprises like this, where you have to deal with Americans and they, they never went to the same army as you did and they don't work the same way that you do and they don't really work in, in a favor-like style, but more in a um, work plan style. So it gets more complicated. So that's the first part about machine learning. This is how we do machine learning, how we try to do machine learning again in, in many different use cases and domains. So that's a good stopping point for questions if you have any. Great. So the next part is how to use machine learning for cyber security. And this is the, the ID security paradigm that we have today in, in most standard organization. So this is the, our, internal security, our internal network, and everything is going on within the company. And from time to time, someone is, is coming and try to hack our system. So he infects one of our devices through some malware, through phishing, through this weird email, uh, through social engineering, a lot of cases like this. And once he gets possession of, of one computer, it tries to spread himself to other computers. And then he finds the data that he wants to, and he delivers back to his external source. So what we do in order to prevent it? We build a fence, some security fence, which um, separate the world into two very distinguished and isolated parts. We have the internal network where everything is cozy and safe and manageable, and we have the external dark internet where everything is going on and they have Russian hackers that are after your money and not necessarily Russian, just hackers. <laughs> um, so once we have this wall, then if someone is trying to infect our uh, machines, then he will crash into the wall and won't be able to infect. And even if someone is already infected, when the attacker will try to get a hold of this data, then the wall will stop him from inside. So there's a lot of different fences like that, antiviruses, firewalls, intrusion detection system, intrusion prevention systems. <coughs> There's a lot of money in this market, obviously. And everyone has that. Every large company has firewalls and antiviruses and all this stuff. This is why Checkpoint sells so many um, systems. And there's only one small problem with this paradigm, and that it doesn't really work. So these are all from last year. A lot of big, big companies that were hacked. And these are not companies of 30 employees that don't care about the security because they're under the radar and nobody will try to attack them. Everybody tried to attack Facebook, tried to attack Facebook and Apple, and they have the best of breed systems, and still they got hacked. Um, and one of my personally interesting Example here is Target. Um, they were breached um, almost a year ago. And when I saw the, the announcement about the breach, I thought it was very funny because I was just two weeks before that, I was in the US and I went to a, to a Target store and I bought some dresses for my daughters because the prices are unbelievably cheap. And, and I thought that it was funny that they bought there and then they got hacked. And about a month later, I got a call from Visa asking me if I bought something in Virginia in $217. And I didn't, obviously. So they canceled it. It's very nice if, if you get uh, fraud through the um, 
credit card company because you get the money back, so you don't really care. And then the, the credit card company also don't really care because they get it from the insurance and the insurance company also don't really care because they get it from us. So it's, it's a nice circle. <laughs> and, but the thing here is, is Target is a huge company, right? And they have uh, a lot of money and they have a, a large security team. And it's not that they didn't detect the attack. They did detect it. They had a, a security analyst in India that detected this attack and issue an alert and send this to the um, company headquarters in the US and they received the attack, uh, sorry, they received the alert along with hundreds of other alerts that they received daily and it was in the queue and they were about to get there but it took a bit more time and during this time these 40 million credit cards were compromised including my one. So why isn't working? Probably because of this. The, the gate is closed, but this is not the only way to um, enter the company. So they have this huge fence and everybody's just going around it. So what if this was your backyard and, and you would want to get better protection? So what I would have done is add in maybe some security camera to know what's going on and some flashlights and maybe some uh, motion detection and, and a dog if you like a dog. And my personal favorite, a uh, tripwire. So everything that goes into your backyard will fall and issue an alert. And, and what that is common for all these is that it provides you better visibility. It doesn't stop anyone. Well, the dog might stop you. But even if people do come into your backyard, you will at least know what is going on. So your fence or your gate is not strong enough, but you know what's going on in your backyard. And this is the main point here. So going back to the security paradigm, which looks a bit uh, like this, so the fence is not as strong as, as we imagined. So what we try to do here is get better visibility. So we monitor everything that has, uh, happens on this border that comes into our system, and we monitor everything that happens within our system, that's a lot of information, and of course everything that comes out of, of, of our systems, and now it becomes a big data problem. So we had machine learning, we had cybersecurity, now we have big data. So I didn't just write them in the, in the title. Uh, there's, there are definitions of big data and, and mainly the three Vs. So there's a variety, there's a lot of data coming from uh, different sources that, that they're very different from each other. And there's the velocity, the update rate of this uh, data is very fast. And of course the volumes, uh, petabytes and more of data. And now we have a, uh, another log of three words. Everybody today has three words something. So here the, the idea is to monitor the data, then to analyze it, and then to detect. So we know that the fences or the old paradigm doesn't work, but the new paradigm seems to work much better. We have better visibility. This costs a lot of money to get this visibil visibility, but, but we want to invest uh, and to put this money into it. So we monitor a lot of data. And then we analyze all this data, and based on this analysis, we detect all the attacks. So again, this, this works great. This is a, a good solution, probably even better th from the last one, better than the last one. And the way we do this, the way that we do the analysis and the detection is through data science, which is the, the new term for machine learning, which used to be the new term for data mining. And the only problem here is that in practice, you don't see it. Data science is, is not really common in IT security system. And again, I'm, I'm talking about best of breed systems, um, IBM, Splunk, our own system. They, they do excellent job in monitoring. They do provide some analysis tools for the users. They have almost no data science. We, we do have some data science in our brochures, uh, and so does IBM. Um, but the actual data science or machine learning capabilities that we provide to the user are very poor. And, and there's an extra question that raises here is, is why? This, you have so much data and it's very valuable, this data, because you really don't want to get rich. It costs you a lot of money and in, in shutdowns and reputation. And still, you don't apply machine learning to it and you don't really have another way to approach this data. It's too big, it's too diverse. So why don't we use actually data science or machine learning for security? 
And, and the real answer is because it's challenging, which is kind of the polite way to say that it's really tough. It's, it's a real difficult task to apply machine learning to cybersecurity, and for some reasons. First of all, is the anomaly detection. So I said that there are two uh, approaches. One is the supervised approach with classifiers, and the other is the unsupervised approach, the anomaly detection. And this is the only way, in most cases, that we can uh, do stuff in cybersecurity because we don't have enough label data. So we use anomaly detection. The problem with anomaly detection is it's, it's tough and it's much less accurate than the supervised learning. And there's a high cost of error. So let's go back to uh, the recommendation and of engine of Amazon, which is a huge, a huge success. At some point, when there used to be just a, a bookstore and not this gigantic monster that they are today, uh, it was said that about 40% of their income come from recommendations. So it's, it's uh, a really helpful tool. So imagine that you come and you buy a book and you get a recommendation for five new additional books and they're really non-interesting. You really don't care about them. You don't want to buy them. You don't even imagine why this engine is suggesting you uh, these stupid books. But not, no actual harm has happened, right? So you have kind of a, a lousy user experience, but it's fine. You don't really care. You still like Amazon, and you're still going to buy your next book there. Now moving to security. If you have a breach and you have a, a small error, you think that this is benign, but this is actually an attack then the cost of error is, is really high. The estimation, the inofficial estimations of the cost of RSA breach was about $65 million. And again, in, mostly in reputation and maybe some compensation to RSA customers. So it costs you a lot of money uh, if you have an error, if you misdetect an attack. But even from the other side, if you uh, misclassify a benign behavior as an attack. So the cost of error is much smaller here, but still, if your system keeps alerting, and if you have a large company, or even a medium-sized company, then you provide hundreds or thousands of alerts per day, and the actual result is that nobody can do anything with it. So they just shut on the system and put it aside, and nobody uses it. So you need to be very accurate, and you have very low tolerance for errors. And that is not public. So if I want to do some uh, face recognition engine, then I go to Facebook or I go to some publicly available um, data sets of images, and I download two millions of images, and I can do all of my stuff. If I want to do some uh, security analysis, so I need some internal data of an IT network, and I need some internal data of attacks, and it's not public. It's very difficult to put your hands on this data. There is a very uh, famous data set of DARPA that was generated in 1996, and everybody's using it because there are real attacks over there. And there are a lot of papers published using this data to, um, to, to this date. I mean, in 2013, there were still hundreds of papers that referred to the DARPA database. So the database is almost 20 years old. Just think how much the environment, how much the IT systems, the application, the mobile, the cloud, everything changed in the last 20 years. It's almost ridiculous to think that people are actually using this database, but they're using it because that's the, base, that the best that there is out there. So you want to get better data, but it's not public. Why? Because it's sensitive. It's real sensitive data. Data from 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Of whom? Of actual users? So you have some databases. Uh, the Los Alamos um, Labs just published a database of 1.6 terabytes. And they had no attacks in it, because 1.6 tera is, sounds huge, but it's not a lot of, of historical data. And most of it, almost all of it, is benign. So no sophisticated attack happened during this time. So they need, needed to simulate and inject attacks. And what I, I would like as a researcher is to get real data with real attacks and, and, and recent data of real users 
and it would be difficult to get it from actual users. Yes. Yes. They, they probably are concerned about the risks and they don't really see the benefit of being the ones that actually donate this to... Yes, they're mainly concerned about liability, of course. And we do uh, collaborative researches here in Israel, in Israel with Ben Gurion University and bar -Ilan University. So I try to extract data and deliver it from, to them. It took me more than a year to extract this data and go through all the legal... Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. It seems that the sensitivity is not a barrier. Yes. <laughs> um, but here, this, this wall functions very uh, effectively. It's very easy to get access to this employee data if you're in the company. It's almost impossible, impossible to get access if you're outside the company. Another challenge is the semantic gap. There are a lot of papers there that provide uh, models and provide detections and the sort of output of these models and the output that the analysts actually want to get are very different. So as researchers we generally provide some anomalies and I explain it as the standard deviation divided by the median is, is larger than three so this makes it interesting. Then you provide it to an analyst and he looks at you and he has no idea what you're talking about. He doesn't understand median and standard deviation, what's to know what's going on? And if I just say that this is an anomaly, then it's not good enough. You have to understand what's going on, what is this alert, what triggered this alert, and provide this sort of explanation, which is very different from uh, the, the general or the common machine learning concept. There, as I mentioned, evaluation difficulties. There are, uh, this is from my research perspective, there are not as many attacks on my company as I would want to. <laughs> so uh, there are very non-interesting attacks. I'm not sure how much you're familiar with the common malwares. There's Zeus, which is very common. Everybody's familiar with it. Everybody knows how to uh, detect it and how to defend from it. So we have a lot of Zeus's in our systems, mainly because we don't care. So uh, I used to think that once I detect a malware, an infected device, then I send this alert to, to someone, to some <coughs> big security guy, and he's very happy with this, and he runs to the device, and then he re-image or uh, blocks it from the network. And actually what happens is that we issue an alert, and this goes into a queue, <coughs> and then after two days, the security guy sends it to the local IT guy, and then the local IT guy sends you an email, saying that please come to, your, to my office, we need to do something with your computer, and this interferes with your daily job, so you come after a week, and then it cleans your uh, computer, and it's okay, because it's not really harmful. Most of that text, yes? How about using honey nets to gather more uh, tech information? That's a good point. I'll, in, I'll get it in, in like five sentences. Um, so the non-sophisticated attacks are commonly known and there are easier tools to handle with them. <clears throat> so at, at the regular day, there are probably hundreds of infected machines in EMC, and everybody's fine with it. What we're worried about are the sophisticated attacks, the directed attacks, which are manual and very difficult to, um, to block and to detect. And as I said, it happened a few years ago and didn't happen since, or at least as far as we know. And this is what I'm looking for, and don't have enough example of this in our data. So there are not as many attacks uh, as I'd want, and also there are not enough labels. So there are petabytes of data, billions of billions of events, probably hundreds of them are labeled. So most of the data, I have no idea what happened, what, what to tell about it, how to evaluate this. So there's a lot of evaluation difficulties. And last, but definitely not least, is the adversarial environment. So everything is changing, the environment is highly dynamic, and, and that's, that's correct for many uh, different use cases, for advertising, for retail. Um, but here we have an actual adversarial, at the other hand, 
and he's human, and humans are very good in adapting. So not only that its environment is changing, it's changing according to our defense systems. And once we build a nice, new, shiny defense system, the attacker will try to learn it and learn its vulnerabilities and then modify its behavior just to attack these specific vulnerabilities. So we need it's kind of a, um, uh, a chase between the attackers and the defenders, <coughs> which makes it not only dynamic, but dynamic on the bad side. So I used to stop on, on, on this part. I used to have actually eight challenges, and then I felt it's too depressing, and I cut it down to six challenges. Um, and then someone told me that that's, that's a really bad point to stop because it looks very bad and the whole thing is, is red. And we do try to do things. So how come that we do, we do, do machine learning for IT security? So we have ways to handle these challenges. And when we look at, at the adversarial environment, we try to build multivariate systems. So I mentioned that humans uh, are very bad with, when handling with a lot of features. We can handle seven, eight, nine features. We can't really handle 100 and more features. So if you build multivariate models, then it will make a hard time for the attacker to understand what the system is doing, is doing and how to adapt to it. And coming back to the honeypots, so we want to get some evaluation, we want to get more attacks, and we want to get labels. So we do have case management, we do have stuff of analysts that go over the alerts and analyze them and put labels uh, that we can use. And we also put some uh, machines with an, an uh, old operating system with no firewall and no antiviruses and just put them outside and they get infected with all the stuff that's happening over there and you can analyze that and you get more information. It's not as good as being actually infected because it's a honeypot and it's in a sandbox environment and it doesn't have all the behavior that an actual user has but it's much better than, than nothing, definitely. And regarding the semantic gap, we work a lot with security experts. So we have our, our machine learning researchers that try to build the best model with the best output. And then we have the security guys, and we talk a lot with them, and we provide them the alerts, and they just throw them on their faces, and they say that it's not good because. And when we get this because, we can tailor and improve our models based on, on what actually the analyst needs. And that is not public. Um, do you know this guy in The Simpsons that, that goes, ha ha? Yeah, okay. Um, so this is actually a problem for the academic researchers, right? When you're inside the company, a large company, and you have billions of um, transactions per day that you have a lot of data. So I have a lot of data to work with. I don't have all the data that I want, but it's much better than being outside the, uh, the cold. Uh, still, the, the bad side here that is that we can't really rely on academic papers. In, in many cases, many use cases, the, um, the most advanced research, research happens only in the university, and then the, the stupid guys in the industry just take this paper, try to understand what's going on, remove some feature, remove some complexities, and implement this. Here we don't have a lot of research to rely on. There are a lot of researchers out there that basically do the same things that we do. And in some cases, we don't have any references to the things that we do. We know that there are a lot of researchers that want to do this stuff. In many cases, they don't have uh, access to the data that we have. Um, so we don't, have the, we don't have the support of the academic research uh, environment as we would like to, to have. As for these two, the anomaly detection and the highest cost of errors, I don't have a good answer for this, other than saying that we need good researchers to solve these problems. And actually, a bit more than this. This is what makes it interesting, because all the problems here are very difficult problems. And I specifically, and I, I guess many of you, we don't really want to solve simple questions. We're interested in the, in the interesting question, then a tough question, then you get some satisfaction, uh, and in some cases a bonus, when you solve these questions. 
So it's difficult to do anomaly detection. It's difficult to get high accuracy and low false positive rate. And that's why it's interesting. So these are the challenges and some of the answers. And there are a lot of talks now on data science, but data science is not actually, it's not really a position. It's more of, of a group. So we have the, the data maestries, who are the people who are in, uh, involved in extracting the data and do all this Hadoop map reduce stuff. And we have the domain experts that used to be called hackers that understand that text because they, they did some of them themselves and understand the use case and the features. And yes, we have the machine learning researchers that take this and try to extract the models. And in our group and in many other groups, we have teams of domain experts and data maestries and researchers and all this together generate the data science. And there are a lot of use cases that we do using these capabilities and I don't have time to go over all of them. Um, probably only a small part of them. I'll start and we'll see where we'll get to. Okay. So we talked about machine learning. We talked about machine learning in cybersecurity. Why is it difficult and why there is um, some promise. And let's go over actual industry use cases. And when I'm saying industry, I mean RSA use cases. That's the use cases I'm more familiar with. The first one is impersonation detection, which is really important because the most interesting part of all this data is the login part. Someone steals your credentials and impersonate to be you and log into the system. And if I can detect and block it on the login part, then that's the best solution because you won't have time to mess around within my network. And I will still know that he uh, got this credential. I can provide new password. So there's a lot of fo focus on the login phase. So what we try to do, among other stuff, is location-based impersonation detection. So this is actual um, sample of our own data. Uh, I used to present it with the actual username until someone mentioned, actually it was our own uh, chief security guy who told me that it's inappropriate to present actual usernames. Um, so he's logging in from China, Zhendong, Gendong, something. And, and two hours later is, is logging in from uh, California. So now it's very easy. So I'll compute the, its velocity and I see that it can't really be in China and two hours later in California because its, it's speed is too fast. So I can generate a very simple rule. Is the, if the velocity is too high, then issue an impersonation alert. So this is not actual data science, right? You use data, but you don't really need to, to have a lot of complicated models in order to generate this rule. But again, again the problem here that if, if you write this rule and just unleash it in the system, it doesn't work in the sense that it would definitely find the attack, but until then, it will find a lot of other stuff that is useless and annoying. Yes? It's a very good example. Or, sorry? Okay, so that's the second bullet. The first bullet is that we have mobile networks. When we just started with it, um, I implemented over our own data, 70,000 70, users, one month of data, and I got alerts. And I was really happy with them because I looked at it and said something like this, China, uh, California, two hours, it must be an impersonation. I was a bit surprised to see that so many people are impersonating in EMC, but I don't really know all of them, so, so go figure. And then I sent, the top five alerts to a local security analyst, and they emailed me back that four of them are simply mobile. And the fifth is also stupid. And <laughs> what's going on here is that, for example, we had a visit from um, one of a corporate guy from the US. He came to our offices in Herzliya, and he logged in from Herzliya. So we see the IP, and we uh, convert the IP to a geolocation. There are a lot of tools that do that. Usually they contradict between themselves. And we know that he's coming from Herzliya. And then five minutes later, he works on a coffee shop and he's communicating through his mobile network. So I see he's coming from AT&T and I know where AT&T is. AT&T is located in New York. So he's logging in from New York five minutes later 
and I get an impersonation alert. And it happens all the time, the data, and I need to handle it somehow. The second thing is the proxy servers, which in an enterprise is less of a problem. This is a more an internet problem. And most of the users don't communicate through proxies. Um, there are a lot of outsourced contractors that communicate through the proxies of their um, company. And they do a lot of load balancing. So someone is um, doing some stuff for EMC and is communicating from his company. His company proxy is in India and it's him coming from India. And then there's a lot of communication coming from India. So they do load balancing and they move him to, <clears throat> to Russia and I see him like a second later in Russia and I get an impersonation alert. We also have this problem within our own offices because our own proxy is in Ireland. So anytime I go to the internet, Google generously suggests me to, uh, to, um, to switch my, um, my query engine from google.com to google.ie because I'm an Irish. Um, and also if I'm trying to see some movies in Ynet, I get some note that these are only for Israeli citizens, uh, which is a good thing because you shouldn't watch uh, movies at work. But still, it's a bit annoying. And so we get a lot of proxy servers like that. And again, most of the data is, is not proxy and not mobile, but most of the alerts are proxies and mobile. And if you have so much data, then you get hundreds of alerts per day. And you do have also location errors. So if you're coming from North America, from Europe, then the location estimation by converting the IP to the geolocation is rather good. If you're going south or east, so Africa or East Asia, um, they're less focused in these areas. So you can get location error of, of 2,000 kilometers. So you get uh, a small movement in your IP and suddenly you're moving from two different countries. And again, you get an impersonation alert. <coughs> <coughs> so each of these problems can be handled directly. We can detect if you're coming from a mobile network <coughs> and then don't, they're not necessarily issue an alert. And we can detect if you're coming from a proxy and we can do something with the location errors. That's more difficult. But we, do, we hate tailoring uh, models to specific stuff. Specifically, we can just list the, the, uh, a table of all the mobile networks. But there are thousands of them and it takes a lot of time to maintain this um, this, this list, this white list. So that's not actually the right way to work. What we do try is to understand from the data if it, this is indeed an impersonation or just a false alarm. So we add data, we add some behavior analysis. We look not only at the speed, but of the time of the user, of the previous location of the user. So okay, he's coming from India and 10 minutes later he's coming from Russia. But is this the first time that I saw him from Russia? Or has he been there a lot of times before, which makes it less suspicious? And we had some context. So maybe this um, login or this location is unexpected for this specific user, but is it regular behavior for, the, for his group? Then it's less suspicious. And we look at that activity. OK, so he logged on. But what did he do once in? Is he doing his regular stuff, or is he doing some other stuff? Is he exfiltrating a lot of data to the outside? And we had additional data, again, as much data as we can. Um, all we know about the device of the user, the HR database, is he an employee, is he a former employee? We did, some, we did see some cases like this. <clears throat> Anything that the data can tell us that we can enrich. And what we get from here is not just an alert of saying this is a high speed or this is a low speed. What we get is some uh, context and some confidence based alert. We can issue an alert and say this is an alert that we're really confident in. This is an alert that we're not so sure, but it's nice to look at. So if you have uh, if you don't have, if you have limited time, look at this top five. If you have more time, look at this. And if it's Christmas and you have nothing to do, look at this low conf confidence alert. So instead of just extracting the speed and put some threshold, we have something that looks a bit more like this. Um, it's not exactly like this because it's IP data, but it's something similar. So the risk score is not only the speed, but there are a lot of other things that we consider, the risking of the speed and the distance confidence and the source confidence and the user anomalies and the device riskiness. And the bottom line of this is that we moved from a model that is, is really nice theoretically but has no use because it had hundreds of alerts per day to something that actually works 
over 300 million users and more with a lot of features, with a lot of data sources, and it saves a lot of money at the end because it's applied to many to online banking systems, not only to corporates. And this is some estimation of, of the actual dollars that we save at the end. It's always nice to present something like this. So just to close the loop, what actually happened here? So we had a user and he came from California and from China and this is his actual uh, office and he really came from California and I would love to tell you more about the China thing but uh, you need to sign on the NDA for us or just come to work for RSA. The second example is fraud detection. So we have a lot of uh, online banking. Uh, I'm, I don't really remember when was the last time that I actually went to the bank. It's really annoying, it takes a lot of time. They always close. And you try to do as, as much as you can uh, online. And that's much easier to break, obviously. So we want to detect fraudulent online banking activities. So it looks something like this. You have the user and you have the activity details and he's trying to log in to his bank. What we have here is the risk engine and we get a lot of data, additional data. We look at the behavior of the user, we look at everything that we know about the device of the user and we have a lot of external um, sources that tell us a lot, a lot about fraud. Other fraud that were applied to other banks. Um, we do a lot of research and we have a lot of intelligence uh, about forums and which attacks they plan and we put all this data inside and then we get some number It's between zero and one thousand zero zero is good. One thousand is very bad And this is 271 here, and then we, we go to some policy manager and This is basically to give the bank analyst the feeling that they control things So we just we don't issue alert. We say this is risky. You can do whatever you want with this so they can answer stuff about it. They can say that if it's below $100, we don't really care. If it's more than $1,000, then we care a lot. And then it's authenticated because it has a really low score and you can continue. And all this is seamless from the user's perspective. And I'm not that sure about uh, the banks in Israel. This is videotaped, right? Okay. So um, the, the banks in the US or in Canada, or Western America, all of them has this system or similar system or both this systems. And any time that you log into them, you get authenticated. Um, because they want to save your money and because they don't like fraud and mainly because of regulation that forces them to apply some sort of risk assessment over your communication. So what happened if you, if you get a high risk score then the policy manager stops you and goes to some step up authentication. So I want to get a better validation that this is indeed you and not an attacker. So there are a lot of stuff that are out of band. I can text you and, and ask you to send back the code and I can challenge you, ask you secret questions and something, ask you something that I know about you. Um, I really feel awkward saying all of this. Um, we try to learn as much as we can about your behavior. So we can ask you um, where was the last time, when was the last time that you purchased gasoline for your car and when was it? Because we get this data from the credit card company because you signed the term of use sometime. Um, and there are a lot of other stuff like this. And now there are two options. One is that you get authenticated, this is really you. You, get, <clears throat> you continue to the system, but we also get the feedback because it means that we were wrong and we want to understand why it happened and improve our model. And the other option is you're not authenticated because you don't know the answer and then you're blocked. It's moved to the case management. Someone probably calls the actual user, tell him that maybe his credential was stolen. And again, we get the feedback back to the model. We know that we're right. We want to first to enjoy it. And then we, we want to reinforce the system <coughs> based on the specific transaction. So these are, uh, again, some data. It, it, it does work over a lot of consumers, a lot of transaction, and it saves a lot of money. And some of it goes to RSA pockets. How much time do I have? Oh. By two minutes. 
And do you want to go over this or should I skip it? Okay, I'll do it very quickly. Um, this is the last thing, thing that I've worked on. It took me about two months to develop the first phase of the model and to present it and to show everyone that it actually works and there were a lot of you know, tailored stuff and, and very tuned parameters. And then it took about three, four months more to make it actually work. And then it took like eight months to implement it and to put it actually in the version and sell it to the marketing guys and then sell it to the sales guys and then sell it to, to the actual paying customers. <clears throat> so we started working on it on June last year and the release would be every day now. It was supposed to be in June and then in August and now in September. So it takes a lot of time, especially in, in a big corporate like this. And the idea is that you communicate with a lot of, of domains. You communicate with Google and Facebook and a lot of other stuff. And occasionally you communicate with some malicious sites that want to infect you. And if you're infected, uh, you communicate with command and controls. So I'm not sure how familiar you are with how the um, TCP IP works, but once you're internally, you can get access from external um, sites. So if Google was to wants to communicate with me, it can do it because it gets blocked. I can communicate with Google, open a socket, and then we can talk to each other. So if uh, I get infected and I have a malware on my device and the attacker, the owner of this malware, wants to communicate with this malware, he can't do it from the outside. And being a while, uh, this malware at this time is having a really hard time because everybody's trying to chase her and to detect it and to remove it from the system. So it might have a very short time, uh, short uh, lifetime and it wants to maintain a very low uh, uh, footprint. So what it's trying to do is to communicate with its uh, owner, usually it's through a, a CSA, a command and control site, and say something like, I'm still alive, nobody killed me, do you have any orders, master? Something like this. And what we want as an organization to, to do is not only detect all these infected sites, but also to block the communications with all these malicious sites. So the way that things are going on today, we have a lot of service provider, and we get these huge blacklists of malicious sites. And we get them from Microsoft and VeriSign and from RSA also. And you get thousands of thousands of domains, and most of them are not uh, malicious at all. Some of them used to be malicious maybe three years ago, um, but the accuracy of this list is very poor. We know that because we wanted to, to rely on it as a data source, and it, it, uh, it's in the area of between 1 and 3%. So one or three of every 100 domains in this list is actually malicious, and all the others are just benign, they're there, and they're still there because nobody cares. Because I get to this site and I get blocked, and really, so what? So there's a, a small link at the bottom of the page that says that if you think that this site was wrongly blocked that you can mail there and it goes to this um, mailing um, location that nobody looks ever and some of our own uh, sites were blocked and then that's fine. There was a time that QQ was blocked. QQ is a huge uh, site in China and then you started seeing a lot of traffic getting blocked and there was a lot of noise and they took it out of, this, of the blacklist. But all this doesn't really work. So we want to do a better job. We want to analyze the behavior of the domain and try to decide if it's malicious or not. So we extract a lot of features and start with something like the average URL lengths and number of distinct URLs. And I don't really want to go over all these features, but a lot of features that both describe the behavior of the domain. And we hope that they can distinguish between benign domains and malicious domains. So once we have these features, we need to somehow normalize them because their ranges are very different. So this is a technicality, but we convert all of them to something between zero and one. This is kind of a simple thing. You always do it on, on, when you work with data. This is extremely difficult to explain to marketing guys and then to customers. But, but why you change the data? Because this is the actual value. And now it's zero to one. What does one mean and what does... But we still do it. And then we have something like this, which is very colorful and, and very nice to present. 
So we have a lot of features, and each vertical line represents one feature, something like the path, the length of the URL, and was it reached through our fare or not? A lot of details, which is not, I'm not going to get into it. And at the end, we get a unified risk that is based on all these features. So we have the, or we analyze the behavior of the domain from very different aspects, and we combine all of them to, the, to one unified risk score. And we hope that if you have a high risk score, it means that you're probably indeed malicious. What we can also get here is pair a specific domain to get some visibility to its behavior, crossing these features. This is very uh, easy to extract from the data. It's extremely valuable to the analyst. It's almost impossible for them to get this from the data. It requires a lot of exhaustive queries and that in many times take a lot of time and don't return at the end. So even just getting some visibility helps a lot. And what you can see here that even when you look in the malicious domain, it doesn't mean that it's malicious in all its perspectives. Some of the features are risky, some of them are not. It means that if you want to write rules that detect these sorts of domains, it would be very difficult because there are a lot of different behaviors that are malicious. But once you look at some aggregated level and the risk score, you can catch all of them at once. So we applied it to our own network. We had some hundreds of thousands of domains. We looked at the top 50 and 68% of them were indeed malicious. This compared to the 1% to 3%. So this is a huge success and it actually works. And we provided it to the marketing guys and they said something like, well, 68%, can't you make it like 85, 90? It would be easier to sell it. Um, so the bottom line here is that this stuff actually works. It's very difficult to apply it to real data, but it's possible. And as I said at the beginning, it's inevitable. So I'm not going to go over the, all these bullets again, but there are a lot of big data out there and it's changing and there's a lot of willing to use machine learning for cybersecurity over big data. It's not there out, uh, still, out, it's not out there yet, but it's going to be, although it's very challenging, but basically it's inevitable. It's the only way that we can actually access this data and use it to detect real uh, sophisticated attacks. Thank you.